For a great deal of my time watching pro res, particularly on the internet, it was pretty common for people to focus on watching one particular match. There's this one meeting that you've got to see, this big encounter that everyone's talking about, or it's just something you've found while searching full match into whatever P2P program you were using. We didn't necessarily focus so much on the card as a whole, watching every match as a prelude to the big bout, or even getting all that much of the story behind a bout. A lot of times you just had the match itself, and whatever info there was surrounding the bout by those in the know. Now I don't believe that this just happened in the internet days. From what I understand, a great deal of the tapes that people swapped around in the trading days would be more like a compilation of matches rather than whole cards. And in fact, the big match itself was usually what the big promotions television programs would focus on. You've got a small time slot in the dead of night, Naturally, it's going to feature the main event and very little else. A lot of those matches were commercially released on videotape. And yes, that's the match exclusively, not the full card that surrounded it. There are of course some exceptions to this rule. From the 1990s, there are two in particular that spring to mind immediately as shows where the recommendation is that you absolutely have to watch the whole lot. The first one is New Japan's 1994 Super J Cup, a one night junior tournament with a whole load of overarching stories, absolutely packed with iconic matches that's still considered one of the very best shows in the company's history. The other one would be All Japan Women's first Dream Slam event from 1993, a show that is also commonly thought as one of the very best, if not the very best pro wrestling supercard of the 1990s, full stop. It's a long show, in fact it's over 5 hours long. But over the course of those 5 hours, AJW and the entire world of Joshi produce a card that's filled from top to bottom with unmissable action. It was the perfect summary of just how phenomenal the standard of wrestling was in All Japan Women and Joshi Pro Res at the time, better perhaps than anywhere else in the entire world. It was, for many years, basically the only card to feature two entirely separate matches rated 5 stars by the Wrestling Observer, something that only happened again at night one of Wrestle Kingdom 14 in 2020. Mind you, All Japan Women did it again later in 1993 in two matches with the same teams, because, well, they were incredible at the time. So it's simply time to look at the first Dream Slam in full the legendary night of April the 2nd, 1993. This will mostly just be going through the show, it is 5 hours long after all, but there will be a little bit of background as to how we got here, and plenty on the participants. The night has had an iconic status for a long time, big enough for stardom to revive the name a few years ago as a way of claiming their place as AJW's true successor. Back then, it was the catalyst for another big boom period in Joshi Pro Res that would ultimately lead All Japan Women to the Big Egg itself. It's not a bad way to celebrate your anniversary, is it? Let us begin. As I just alluded to, the main aim of the AJW Dream Slam was to celebrate the company's 25th anniversary. Founded in 1968 by the Matsunaga brothers, they'd had periods of irrelevance mixed with huge periods of popularity, usually times when the company's wrestlers would be successful not just in wrestling, but in entertainment. The last time we looked at Joshi, we looked at the company's previous boom period back in the mid-80s, a time that was dominated by the incredibly popular Crush Gals team of Jigusa Nagayo and Lioness Asuka, and the atrocious alliance led by Dump Matsumoto. Their wars were legendary, emotional, and watched by many people. As we got to the end of the 1980s, and these wrestlers reached the company's mandatory retirement age of 26, naturally things would die down a little bit. But a lot of young folk were naturally inspired by what they saw on the television. It's fair to categorise the raft of truly incredible dojo classes that would come down the pipe in the years to come as being mostly made up of Crush Gals and Atrocious Alliance fans, and these were the wrestlers that would contribute to a wholly different Joshi boom. There's something else to talk about here of course. In the time since the feud between the Crush Gals and the Alliance, a great deal of things have changed. For many years, AJW was pretty much the only Joshi game in town, and they did have certain quirks, chief amongst them being that retirement age. 
Essentially, wrestlers would have around 10 years to do their thing, and then it would all be over. They leave Joshi behind, and new folks come in to replace them. It seems wild nowadays that this was a thing, but it was primarily down to old school societal reasons, and the stigma that came with being a leftover woman who hadn't married by the age of 30. So you do your Joshi, dedicate yourself entirely to that, and then leave in order to fulfil your duties as a woman, I guess. Old fashioned? Well, absolutely. But such was the way of things back then, and not necessarily just in Japan, China and other Asian countries. Needless to say, this was a big part of why AJW's business could be so volatile and filled with hills and valleys, but it was the way things were done. However, particularly after such a golden generation, you did have quite a few high-level wrestlers who, well, they weren't exactly willing to quit just because they were closer to 30 than 20, and they were certainly popular enough to exist in a world outside of Zenjoshi, or Zenjo. In the second half of the 1980s, new companies would begin to form and take their own place in the world of Joshi, first and biggest amongst them being JWP, or Japan Women's Pro Wrestling. The new company would contain a great deal of former AJW stars, the legendary Jackie Sato, Devil Masami, Hayali Saito and Itsuki Yamazaki, formerly of the Jumpin' Bomb Angels, chief amongst them. But there would also be new stars too, with the likes of Mayomi Yazaki, Dynamite Kansai and Cutie Suzuki making their name here, not to mention a certain shooter by the name of Shinobu Kandori. While some of these wrestlers started in the AJW dojo, or were initially rejected by them, they'd find their way to the new company, and soon enough they were training up wrestlers themselves. In 1992, due to an internal dispute, the original Japan Women's Pro Wrestling would split into two different companies. The more classically pro wrestling folk would remain under the banner of JWP, now called JWP Joshi Pro Res, while the more shoot-inclined wrestlers, led by Shinobi Kandori, would form Ladies Legends Pro Wrestling, or LLPW. The closest thing really that Joshi had to a UWF-esque shoot style promotion. Shinobu Kandori was also one of the more legit people in the business. She had once been a high level judoka, skilled enough to win bronze at the world championships in 1984 and at a point where she could have competed at the 1988 Seoul Olympics before deciding to switch to pro wrestling. Her gimmick, as a heel, was that of a martial artist who had nothing but contempt for pro wrestling, considering herself far above all others. She claimed that she could beat even the biggest of stars in mere seconds. Even her training had been somewhat different. She'd actually gone to train in the New Japan Dojo under Katetsu Yamamoto and Yoshiaki Fujiwara, where she'd spar with the men. The new promotion, LLPW, would see Kandori be joined by Rumi Kazama, a kickboxer in her high school days and the new company's president, as well as a fresh out of retirement, Norio Tateno, the other half of the Jumpin' Bomb Angels. For this relatively new company, the Dream Slam would be a huge night indeed, as we'll see. After all, while AJW were keen to be separate from these new rival companies at first, things would change here in the early 90s, the Joshi companies, old and new, would start to work together. Part of this was perhaps due to a bit of a downturn in the business following the retirement of the Crush Gals and all of that, it became clear that these companies would be stronger if they worked together. That and in many ways AJW was the mother company, there would be no JWP or LLPW without them and a 25th anniversary celebration for the mother company would certainly feel very incomplete without the wrestlers who are now representing these other promotions. 1992 was where the cross-promotional antics really started kicking off, with the companies combining for some incredible cards. The Dream Rush 92 card from 26 November 1992 was a major highlight, particularly for the 2 out of 3 falls tag team main event. The top teams of both All Japan Women and JWP would duke it out for the tag team titles in one of, quite simply, the greatest tag bouts there has ever been. AJW's Manami Toyota and Toshio Yamada were one half, JWP's Dynamite Kansai and Mayomi Ozaki were the other. Together they produced a contest that would add to the legends of all four wrestlers, and it certainly helped to make the JWP team of Kansai and Ozaki, both of whom had been largely trained up by the newer company, into major Joshi stars. With a match like this being so utterly incredible, 
What if you tried to do a huge card that was essentially filled with nothing but huge matches like this one? The trio of AJW, JWP and LLPW would all come together to make up the majority of the Dream Slam card, which would be almost totally filled with interpromotional bouts. However, there is one other promotion to add to the mix, one that tends to do things a little bit differently, and that would be at Sushi Anita's FMW. The hardcore alternative, the extreme folks who like to do all the big matches with fire and barbed wire and great big explosions and so on. FMW may not need too much of an introduction, but they also do things differently by actually having a women's division. There aren't many companies in Puro at all where men and women wrestle on the same card, but FMW was one of them. Not only that, the women aren't just off in the sidelines, they're amongst the biggest stars. And while FMW and the Joshi companies don't usually do much in the way of business with each other, the Dream Slam is going to be an exception. There is, after all, a bit of storyline potential here. FMW's women's division contains a good few strong wrestlers, but two are undoubtedly at the top of it, Megumi Kudo and Combat Toyoda. The funny thing is that both Kudo and Toyoda were products of the AJW Dojo, starting out in 1986. They were seen to have potential early on, but in such a fast moving promotion they both ended up falling by the wayside, and Zenjo released them in 1988. With AJW still seen as the only big game in town back then, Kudo and Toyoda left wrestling behind for a couple of years, until FMW came along and started to look into fill up a women's division. The faster Kudo and stronger Toyoda quickly became shining stars. They may not be as technically gifted as the best of AJW, but they're certainly willing to fight and take part in hardcore bouts. Megumi Kudo in particular is one of the biggest stars in FMW's history, male or female. And well, this return to All Japan Women as the stars of FMW has the makings of being a pretty good main event, with the top two FMW stars going against AJW's top team, Manami Toyota and Toshio Yamada, two aces who are as AJW as AJW can possibly be. This is just one match, of course, in a card that will feature many. When you look at the whole card, particularly at the home team, the amount of talent on show is quite simply staggering. There are a good few people who've been around a while of course, but many of AJW's biggest and best stars have come through in the last few years, out of the dojo. For a reason as to why AJW's level of talent was so phenomenal, you need look no further than the woman in charge of said dojo, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, Rimi Jaguar Yakota. In a career lasting from 1977 to 1986, Jaguar Yakota achieved so much, ridiculously ahead of her time, an innovator, a complete wrestler, one of the greatest technicians there's ever been. She was a phenom, a once in a lifetime sort of talent that you just don't see every day, and she did all of this in the ring before the age of 24 when she retired. But her achievements in the ring would be matched or even topped by what she did as a trainer. Just take one look at the talent she produced, Manami Toyota, Aja Kon, Toshio Yamada, Kyoko and Takako Inoue, Megumi Kudo and many more were trained by Yakota, and if it wasn't for that, well this show probably doesn't happen. Jaguar Yakota trained up an entire golden generation, and she has a big part to play in the outrageous standard of early mid 90s Joshi. The show has most of the card largely set up by the time February comes along, with a few little changes to come here and there. One of the biggest announcements is the return of Chigusa Nagayo. The most popular women's wrestler of all time is returning to Lorin after spending some time as an actress, mostly taking the lead in a play and later film about her called Rin Rin Rin, the champion belt of tears. Nagayo was initially set to face fellow AJW wrestler Bull Nakano in an exhibition, but the match soon changed to an interpromotional one against JWP representative and old rival Devil Masami. Megumi Kudo's role on the card also changes. It appears as though initially she would have faced AJW's champion, Aja Khan, but the outcome couldn't be agreed on. Therefore we get the tag match with Toyoda against Minami Toyota and Toshio Yamada instead. 
there will be a slight representation for Lucha Libre promotion EMLL, who have a long-standing agreement with Senjo, and there will be a martial arts match with Round Walls on the card too, featuring Bat Yoshinaga. While most of the best wrestlers on the roster will be present and correct here, it is important to know that one of AJW's strongest up-and-comers, Mariko Yoshida, will miss the show thanks to an injury. AJW are doing everything they can to fill up the 17,000 seat Yokohama Arena for the show, with the simple aim of producing their biggest card ever, beating the likes of Chigusa Nagayo's retirement in 1989. By the end of February, it very much looks like they're going to pull it off. As we get into the final couple of weeks before the big show, we do get another rather unfortunate change. Debbie Malenko suffers a terrible broken leg in a match on March the 11th, after a freak accident when catching Manami Toyota on a dive. She will miss the Dream Slam and unfortunately, the injury will prove to be a career ender. Kairu Ito will replace her on the card, tagging with Saki Hasegawa against JWP's Plum Mariko and Hikari Fukuoka. There will also be a ceremony on the card featuring a great deal of past stars, the likes of Lioness Asuka, Dump Matsumoto, Jaguar Yokota and Nuio Tatino will be present, as well as some of the original big stars of the promotion, like Nancy Kumi and Much Fumike. There are only a couple of notable omissions. Jackie Sato will not be there due to existing heat between her and AJW, and Itsuki Yamazaki of the Jumping Bomb Angels can't make the flight over from New York. With this being an interpromotional card, there isn't an awful lot in the way of angles. The big press conference for the show sees most of the wrestlers talking up their matches and opponents in a sports-like manner, although there is one exception here. The build-up for the match between Akira Hakuto and Shinobu Kandori results in a lot of heated discussion, a shoe being thrown, and both wrestlers having to be restrained. An appropriate angle, perhaps, for a match which will see one of Joshi's greatest representatives taking on someone who has little but scorn for traditional professional wrestling. And with all this gone through? Well, it's time to get into the big card itself. Once again, it's 5 hours long, and there's 11 matches to go through so there's a lot to take on. As is often the case with Puro cards, we're going to be seeing a lot of tag matches, and this first bout promises to be a good opener. The AJW team of Kairu Ito and Saki Hasegawa goes up against JWP's Plum Mariko and Hikari Fukuoka. Four very good wrestlers indeed, this match certainly promises to be a speedy one, Saki Hasegawa in particular is fast as anything and a hot prospect, Plum Mariko is noted for combining fast speed with highly technical submissions, and Hikari Fukuoka is probably most famous for her phenomenal moonsault double stomp. The Jaguar Yokota trained Kairu Ito rounds Finns off simply by being a tough customer. Hopefully this should kick Finns off pretty nicely. And yes, this is a magnificent opener. Everyone has a chance to shine in this incredibly fast tag bow, the variety of moves on display is really something, and the speed is off the scale. There's quite a lot of highlights here, obviously you do get some nice aerial moves, like a picture perfect corkscrew senton from Ito, and a wonderful moonsault from Fukuoka, but there's a fair bit more than that. Plum Mariko does get a chance to show off some of her submission skills, with rolling knee bars and, of course, her signature and innovative stretch plum. There's the brilliant moment when Hasegawa hits five textbook double arm suplexes in a row on Mariko, and there's a whole lot of fire with all four wrestlers leaving everything, determined to beat the other team at all costs. It certainly packs an awful lot of action into a little over 15 minutes, not letting up at any time. The finish sees JWP pick up the win. With Ito and Fukuoka fighting on the outside, Mariko catches Hasegawa on the top rope, executing a Hurricane Rana and holding on for the free count, putting JWP on the board. This opening alone got a four and a quarter star rating from Old Meltzer, and it's just about one of the hottest tag openers you'll find on any 90s Puro supercard. Of course, we do need a little about these wrestlers and how their careers would pan out. Hikari Fukuoka would be a constant in JWP through the whole of the 1990s and would just get better and better. She'd be one of the company's best later in the decade and, well, of course there's that finisher. She retired in 1999, although she does appear now and again in Battle Royals. 
Kaoru Ito would have a much longer career. Indeed, she's pretty much still going today, at the age of 50, and she even dabbled a little in MMA. Saki Hasegawa was one of AJW's big prospects, as mentioned. She'd even be seen in a WWF win, taking part in that match at Survivor Series 1995 with a whole host of other AJW stars. However, her career was unfortunately cut short in 1996. Just as she was on the verge of becoming a top star, injuries became too much for her, and she chose to retire early. And then, well, there's Plum Mariko. I've gone into the sad story of Plum before, of course. She was an amazing and quite unique wrestler, but injuries would have a terrible effect on her. She continued to wrestle even though said injuries should really have stopped her, and then tragically she would pass away in the ring on the 16th of August 1997 at the age of only 28, becoming the first pro res wrestler to die as a result of an injury in a match. A terrible incident and a great shame. Up next, it's time for FMW to make their first appearance. The team of Crusher Made Amari and Shark Suchia certainly look mean enough, what with their face paint and so on. Hell, they wouldn't have looked out of place in Dump's Atrocious Alliance. They'll face the home team of Sami Numata and Terry Power, who had a background in bodybuilding and looks appropriately strong. At this point, Americans may have seen her in the rather short-lived LPWA, where she'd held the singles belt at the promotion's closing. Naturally, this quartet has a bit of a tough act to follow, considering the high quality and the heat of the opener, and perhaps it's not too surprising that they don't get up to that level. So yeah, this is one of the weaker matches on the whole Dream Sam card. Not that it's terrible, but it's just not quite up to everything else. It's a shorter match, and naturally, seeing as it's the FMW duo, there's lots of brawling. Maidamari and Suchio are certainly going to mostly be punching and healing it up, although Shark does do a couple of power moves. Terry Power also gets in a good few dry slaps, and there's a bit of fire from Numata. But still, this match does get a bit messy here and there. There are some rather disappointing botches, including one on a face crusher that kind of brings everything to a standstill for a moment. The finish sees Crusher and Terry brawl, leaving Numata at Shark's mercy. She survives for a little while, but ultimately succumbs to a powerbomb. AJW still don't have a win on their own card, and the FMW women stand tall. It's a pretty average match. The brawling isn't too bad, but Numata appears to be quite green still, and Terry Power doesn't do an awful lot. Mind you, she does appear to be working with one arm only due to injury, and that undoubtedly limited her. Not exactly an essential watch, although not awful. Sami Numata also wrestled as Numachi, and she did at one point wear a hard hat. She didn't really get beyond the mid-card, only wrestling from 1990 to 1994. Maidamari and Sachia both had solid careers, spent mostly in FMW, and both would hold the women's title. Although Shark wrestled a lot longer, and is probably better known overall, mainly for being one of Megumi Kudo's toughest opponents. And of course, Terry Power is the wrestler here people are most likely to know, because a few years later, and looking rather different, she'd be hired by WWF. Terry Power became Tori, she was initially presented as an obsessive fan of Sables, and after that she... Well, she did mostly hang around for a couple of years, although she was part of Heel DX at one point. Oh, and she was Kane's girlfriend for a time before turning and hooking up with X-Pac. And who could forget the mysterious Black Ninja? In all honesty, Tori never really seemed to fit in. Mind you, she did have that really freaking cool alley oop plex that she did. She left in 2001 under something of a cloud, and quit wrestling soon after to pursue a career in yoga. Up next, we have a little appearance from EMLL. Esther Moreno, who wrestles under Ultimate Iguita, will team with Kaoru Maeda against the heel AJW team of Tomoko Watanabe and Mima Shimoda. Once again, this promises to be another pretty high-octane bout, while also perhaps having a bit more contrast than the previous two. And it proves to be that way, with another nice little gem of a match. Naturally, the EMLL team goes all out with the high flying. There's plenty of big arm drags, big springboards, and big dives whenever they get the opportunity, while the AJW team try mostly to ground them. The more powerful Watanabe tends to go for submissions, while the utterly brilliant Shimoda, who'd already been around for a few years by this point, can pretty much do everything. 
She can fly too, and she certainly proves that, but she's also a pretty vicious heel brawler. Generally, both teams play off very nicely, and the match is another exciting one. There perhaps isn't too much here in the way of psychology and what have you, but there's certainly a lot of action and entertainment. Again, however, it's the outsider team who managed to sort out the victory. With Taguito and Shimoda brawling on the outside, Watanabe seems to have an edge on Kaoru, but again, a mistake is made and Kaoru manages to wrap Tomoko up in a La Maestral cradle to get the free count, and leave all Japan women still thoroughly winless. A really good little match, mind you. Esther Moreno had a long career, mostly in Mexico, and is generally pretty underrated. She switched from EMLL to AAA not too long after this, and wrestled all over the place, only retiring in September of last year. Kaoru Maeda would be most famous when simply called Kaoru, working pretty high on the card a few years down the line for Gaia. She's still working today, as are the other two wrestlers. Watanabe would always be a very capable hand indeed, usually working pretty high up the card, while Mima Shimoda, well, she's a legend. Already well known for her Tokyo Sweethearts team with Manami Toyota, she turned heel and formed the almighty Las Cachorras Orientales, simply known as LCO, or the Oriental Bitches, with Etsuko Mita, who we'll see in the next match, and briefly Akira Hakuto. LCO would be one of the great Joshi tag teams all over the place, and Shimoda would prove herself to be utterly capable in just about any style of wrestling going anywhere in the world. A truly exceptional hand. Our next match sees the aforementioned Etsuko Mita teaming up with Suzuka Minami, previously in a tag team with Akira Hakuto called the Marine Wolves, going against LLPW representatives Rumi Kazama and Miki Honda. Kazama, as mentioned, was one of the founding wrestlers behind LLPW, while Miki Honda has a bit of experience and even made a brief appearance in WCW circa 1991. With LLPW being the new promotion on the block, they naturally go into this match as the underdogs, particularly against two very good wrestlers with pretty well established tag team pedigrees, and that's as good a story as any to go into this match. We do have a bit of a change of pace here, as you might expect from the fourth match in. This one goes a bit slower, and indeed a bit longer, with the bout lasting a little over 20 minutes. Naturally it's still excellent, everyone has a solid role to play in this one. On the LLPW side, Kazama uses her kickboxing background to great effect with some pretty effective kicks, while Miki Hunter, pretty obscure name nowadays, is really good, sells very well, and does a great job of being the match's Ricky Morton. Etsuko Mita is incredibly fiery and, much like her usual partner Mima Shimoda, is great at pretty much everything from brawling and healing to technical skills, and Suzuka Minami is an excellent and underrated wrestler, technically marvellous, and everything she does looks glorious. There's many fabulous moments here, from a stunning super electric chair drop, pulverising double drop kicks from the top, and a few cracking suplexes and power bombs. but the match does become a real story of two great teams cancelling out the other, one that's going to require a team taking just the slightest bit of advantage in order to get the victory. In the end, after 22 brilliant minutes, Mita makes the error. She runs Kazama to the ropes, but right into Minami, knocking her off the apron. Kazama reacts fast, going behind Mita and executing a picture-perfect German suplex for the free count and a huge upset victory for the new promotion. A really freaking good match this one. While there's a lot of tags on this card, and a lot of them are justifiably famous, this is a pretty special bout too, and worthy of attention. As mentioned before, Etsuko Mita would have a huge team with Mima Shimoda as the LCO. They'd wreck absolute havoc in AJW, not to mention later on in promotions like Arjakon's Arsian, and they're very much worth seeking out. Suzuka Minami was a brilliant hand who worked high on the card and was loyal to AJW, starting in 1985, retiring in 1995 in the usual fashion, and never entering the ring again. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of info on Miki Honda, but she would go on to win the AJW tag titles and would have a decent career. Rumi Kazama would continue to be active both as a wrestler and as LLPW's president for years to come, before fully retiring in 2012, opening a restaurant, and also starting a YouTube channel where she interviewed fellow pro wrestlers. Sadly, however, Rumi Kazama passed away suddenly in September of 2021, at the age of 55. 
Kazama was never at the top of any promotion that she worked in, but she was an excellent talent and ambassador for Joshi. A very sad loss. Okay, we'll keep this one brief. The next match isn't a wrestling match, but an actual shoot fight featuring AJW's martial arts champion, that Yoshinaga, against an American boxer named Susan Howard. It's a bit of a weird one, of course. Three five minute rounds under kickboxing rules, and it all gets rather sloppy and gassy as you might expect it to. Not exactly much special to speak of, although the whole Bat Yoshinaga and the Martial Arts Championship is an odd sort of blur between gimmick and shoot. Yoshinaga carried this belt for a whole chunk of her time in AJW and never lost it, although her background in martial arts appears to be a bit hazy. As a wrestler she certainly wasn't the best, although she did have a place in tag matches. As far as Susan Howard goes, well, I believe that these days she owns a boxing club back in the States and has had a good few pro fights. Anyway, this is most definitely the weakest part of the whole card, and the one thing that you should probably skip over unless you really want to see some quite sloppy fighting. At this moment, we do get a quick little ceremony to celebrate AJW's 25th anniversary, complete with lots of the company's past stars coming out to Lurin for introductions and promos alongside the Matsunaga brothers. There's plenty of great names from all over the company's history, including lots of folks that you may well recognise, Linus Asuka, Dump Matsumoto, Norio Tateno, just to name a few. One of those nice little fins, really, and the sort of fin that befits a show like this one. There's a couple of names that are missing for various reasons, of course, but we did go into that a little before the show. Another two names who you may well expect to see in this ring laughing and smiling along with everyone else are Chigusa Nagayo and Devil Masami, but they've got a good reason not to be a part of this ceremony, seeing as they're about to face off against each other in a big bout. Let's take a look at that now. It's time for our first singles match of the night, and it's nothing less than the in-win return of the most popular star in the history of Shoshi Pro Res, Chigusa Nagayo. She'd spent a few years out after her official retirement in 1989, mostly in front of a camera starring in a movie and play about her life and career, but now she's back, at least for these glorious and special events. Or so it seems. Jigusa Nagayo certainly doesn't have an easy return. She's going up against not just one of her greatest rivals, but another one of the great names of Joshi, Devil Masami. Masami initially retired in 1987, per HIW tradition, but she soon decided that she didn't want to stay out of the ring, and so she became a part of JWP in order to continue a glorious career that had started in 1978. Fifteen years later, she continues to be one of Joshi's top stars. Indeed, in 1993, she is still considered to be amongst the world's very best wrestlers, regardless of gender. Devil Summer was already considered to be Hall of Fame material. Return matches don't get much tougher than this one, which is being rightly billed by the company as a super fight. So what do we get here? Well, we get a pretty bloody good match, naturally. Jigusa Nagayo may have been out of the ring for four years, but she doesn't appear to have lost a step. She's still got the same great technical and striking ability, and she's one of the best sellers in the game too. Devil Masami, as mentioned, was a top wrestler in 1993, and yeah, she is just wonderful to watch. Visually, she's one of the most charismatic and expressive wrestlers in the whole history of Joshi, and all of that is very much on display, and her skill is right up there. Naturally, the pair work a bit slower than what we've seen on the card. It's a slow burner, a seeming exhibition that quickly turns into a continuation of a long rivalry, and a very hot crowd indeed for the whole of the match. There's a lot of great technical wrestling, and also a lot of nice little details to be found, the sort of match that benefits from re-watching. Now of course, in pro res it's usually common for a returning wrestler, no matter how famous, to end up on their back in their comeback. And sure enough, the finish sees Nagayo getting caught by Masami on the turnbuckle and punished severely. She survives for a time, kicking out of three finishing Masami powerbombs, but Devil Summer finally poleaxes her with a brutal Northern Light suplex from the top. Both wrestlers are interviewed together in the post-match, full of smiles and respect. I feel that this match is a bit overshadowed compared to some of the others on the card, but particularly the one that's going to follow on immediately, but it's still another great, great match from the Dream Slam. 
These two wrestlers have a very high standard and they sure as hell didn't disappoint. Devil Masami would continue to be a big part of Joshi for many more years and she would also win the WCW women's title in 1997. She largely spent most of her time in Gaia Japan from 1995, which we'll talk more about very shortly, before retiring in 2008 after 30 years in the business, a member of both the AJW Hall of Fame and Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. Chigusa Nagayo's return match was initially presented as a one-off, but she would continue to appear sporadically and, sure enough, she would fully return to the business in 1995 at the head of a new promotion named Gaia Japan. Gaia was a great promotion, and in the aftermath of the implosion of AJW in the late 90s, Gaia would become the top promotion in Joshi's more fragmented world. Nagayo would be a part of that both in and out of the ring, with many big angles, not least amongst them the eventual reuniting of, and feud between, the Crush Gals with Lioness Asuka. Nagayo officially retired from full-time in 2005, but still makes occasional exhibition appearances and is now at the head of a Joshi company called Marvelous. She remains unquestionably the biggest star in the history of Joshi Prores, and perhaps in the whole history of women's wrestling. Now, I don't want to big up this next match too much, but it's one of the two matches on this card that Dave Meltzer awarded five whole stars to, so you know, no biggie. It's another clash between AJW and JWP, featuring four absolute top level stars. The AJW team of Kyoko and Takako Inoue, otherwise known as the Double Inoues, against the JWP team of Cutie Suzuki and Mayomi Ozaki. The JWP team were the company's reigning tag champs at the time, and Ozaki already had some tag classics against AJW under her belt, those stunning matches teaming with Dynamite Kansai against Manami Toyota and Toshio Yamada during the previous year. A lot of the big matches on this card have special names. This one is called Shining Stars, and that seems pretty appropriate. Everything's just about set here for something amazing, and this match is most certainly going to provide. So, wow. This match is likely openers, only it's on steroids and with an incredibly heated crowd. All four wrestlers take part in an absolutely amazing contest. The action is so rapid and fluid here, it just seems, well, years ahead of anything else. And yet this isn't just a spot fest, there's a lot of psychology and story going on, particularly in the context of the whole card with AJW still yet to pick up their first win. It's hard to put into words just how good this quartet is. Kyoko Inoue and Mayomi Ozaki in particular are virtually peerless and responsible for a fair few of the great moments, whether it's some of Ozaki's blinding suplexes or Kyoko's stunning near 40 rotation giant swing on Suzuki. Don't underrate the other two though. Takako is just about as good and far too underrated when compared to some of the other greats of 90s Joshi. As for Cutie Suzuki, it's often said that her skill is lesser when compared to other greats, considering her status on the card, but really this is wildly overstated. She's bloody good as well. The desperation and aggression just gets wilder and wilder, particularly when the JWP team combine for five double stomps on Kyoko, anything to keep her down, and at no point does the level sag. They just do not put a foot wrong here, at all. The last stretch action between Kyoko and Ozaki is really something special, and at last the edge goes to the AJW team. The Inoue's combine for an assisted Niagara driver, and with Suzuki just about thwarted from another last ditch break, the move's enough for the free count. AJW are on the board at last, and the contest itself is, well, out of this world. One of the best Joshi tags of the 90s, and a match that you should go ahead and watch right this instant. All of the participants in this match have achieved legendary status, of course. The Double Inoue's team still continues to this day with appearances here and there, although Kyoko Inoue would achieve more in the way of single success, especially in 1995, when she was quite arguably the best wrestler of the whole year, male or female. She was something else. Don't underestimate Takako though, who had her own part to play in some amazing events. Cutie Suzuki largely stayed loyal to JWP, while also being one of the company's crossover stars, and retired from the ring in 1998, although she did return for a one-off match in 2013. 
Mayumi Miyazaki has wrestled all over the shop in all sorts of styles, from the most technical bouts to some of the most hardcore, and she's done more than enough to warrant a status as one of Joshi's greatest. Both Kyoko Inoue and Mayo Miyazaki would also form their own promotions. Kyoko founded Neo Ladies, and Azaki created Oz Academy. The eighth match on the card certainly features two teams of seriously tough wrestlers going at it. On the AJW side, we have a team that's as dominant as it gets, Arja Khan and Bull Nakano. Nakano is serious enough, what with that utterly unique look and propensity for violence, but Arja Khan is the complete wrestling monster, and she's the queen of the company, the reigning and dominant WWWA champion. That said, the LLPW team isn't any kind of slouch. Eagle Sawai and Harley Saito are both thoroughly seasoned veterans. Sawai's got power to match Arja Khan, and Saito's got the strikes and the heart. Can the new promotion upset the odds once again? Now, of course, this match did have a very tough act to follow after the previous bout, and the crowd are perhaps a bit noticeably quiet for it, but it's still a good one, albeit one that's more of a straight-out fight than a technical showcase, as you might expect. You still naturally get lots of power moves, especially from the almighty Con, and most of them are pretty savage, but you do get a couple of nice bits with the weapons, particularly when Nakano brings her signature nunchucks in, only to find that Saito can get pretty flashy with them too. The LLPW team do have strong highlights, and even force these two titans into doing things you wouldn't normally see them do. Arja Khan executing a plunger is certainly something, and most definitely awesome. Eagle Sawai gets some good stuff in. She's by far the least known worker in this match, but Con puts her over pretty strong, with Sawai getting the power advantage over her in several exchanges, something that almost nobody did. But eventually, in this case, the LLPW team are quite overmatched. Saito gets decimated by Arja Khan with two thoroughly vicious Urakens, and even though Sawai is able to break up the pin following Nakano's first guillotine leg drop, She's not around to break up after a devastating, twisting somersault leg drop. The AJW team get the win that you would expect, but the LLPW team did put on a great showing, and there's a lot of respect shown at the end of the match, with Nakano even handing over the nunchucks to Saito. While this match isn't necessarily a highlight bout on a card that's this good, it certainly would be on plenty of other cards. A perfectly good match for something that's mostly a bit of a brawl. Both Eagle Sawai and Harley Saito could be found in plenty of promotions over the course of their careers, generally roaming free. They would both win LLPW's main singles title several times, along with plenty of other titles. Sawai retired in 2007 and Saito in 2012, although sadly Harley Saito passed away in December of 2016 due to cancer at the age of 49. Bull Nakano would continue wrestling until 1997. She had quite a wild run that also contained a bit of time in the WWF and her feud with Alundra Blaze over the women's title, which was one of the few definite highlights of the promotion's 1995. She's done all sorts of things after wrestling, including becoming a professional golfer, and nowadays she has a YouTube channel where she interviews fellow Joshi wrestlers and legends. Arja Khan would continue to be dominant, holding the main WWWA Championship for 850 days, a reign second only to Bull Nakano's previous 1057 day stint with the belt. Indeed, the best was yet to come, especially when her epic feud with Manami Toyota really got going. After AJW, she'd form her own promotion by the name of Arceon. One of the best Shoshi wrestlers and monsters of all time, she's still very much going to this day. Now, believe it or not, for a show that's over five hours long, we've actually only got three matches to go. Despite the length, this is a show that absolutely flies by. Part of that is down to the speed of the action, of course, not to mention the high quality, but this version of the show does have a pretty no frills presentation. You get pre- and post-match interviews, and the match footage doesn't have entrances, just the ring announcer intros. The action basically does the talking, although that hardly matters when it's so good. Anyway, it's time for another singles match. We've got one of the great aces of JWP, Dynamite Kansai, against the excellent and very much legit Yumiko Hotta, 
one of AJW's great rising stars who's going to become a major player very soon. These two should be a very good match for each other, and seeing as this is the main AJW vs JWP bout on the card, there's a lot of bragging rights at stake. Jeez, this is one seriously stiff bout. In a good way, of course. Dynamite Kansai and Yumiko Hotta are two of the best kickers in the whole of the business, and they absolutely bring the pain to each other to a point that's going to make just about anyone cringe. Both wrestlers get moments where it's teased that they've knocked out the other, and they seem to pretty much just lay everything in. So if you enjoy big old head kicks, then you've most certainly come to the right place. Two arse kickers like this pair quite simply complement each other perfectly, and once again it feels like the only way that anyone's going to get the win is through one simple little mistake. After all, even beyond the kicks they throw their best at each other, pile drivers, power bombs, backdrops, even a top rope straightjacket suplex, all not enough to get the job done. The finish sees Hotter try to take Kansai's head off with another roundhouse, but Kansai dodges, hits one of her own, and then positions Hotter on her shoulders for a big splash mountain to get the win. It is a bit odd as Hotter does appear to actually kick out before the three, but the finish is called anyway. Even with that little botch in mind, this is just another fantastic match on the card, and another match that provides something a bit different to what we've already seen on the card. The range of this show is something else, and absolutely everyone's giving their very best. There's a big show of respect between these two at the end, which is fair enough considering that they've just taken some serious lumps out of each other. Yumiko Hotta would continue to become more of an ass kicker, adding a lot more mixed martial arts to her gimmick from 1994 onwards, and eventually becoming a multiple time WWWA Women's Champion. She's still an active wrestler today and can be found in various indie Joshi promotions such as Assemble and Seedlinen. Dynamite Kansai would continue to be awesome too. That inevitable war with Arja Khan when it happened sure was a good one. She eventually moved from JWP to Gaia and the Indies in the 2000s, mainly in forever tag partner Mayo Miyazaki's Oz Academy, before retiring in 2016. Both Hotu and Kansai, like many wrestlers on this card, are unquestionable Joshi Pro as legends who you ought to check out plenty more matches of, if you haven't previously. Up next, it's the semi-main, and it's the match with a fair bit of heat behind it. If you recall back to the pre-show, you'll remember that Akira Hakuto and Shinobu Kandori had to be pulled apart at the press conference where everyone else was generally being respectful. This is a match with a tailor-made story. Akira Hakuto, the Dangerous Queen, is Miss AJW. Hell, she's Miss Joshi Pro Res. Flashy, charismatic, and talented beyond description. While Hakuto is Joshi to the core, LLPW's Shinobu Kandori has boasted of her legit shooter background and her contempt for pure pro wrestlers. For her, someone like Akira Hakuto represents all that she dislikes. It's only natural that this match is going to get quite heated and possibly even quite violent. Indeed, even though this isn't the last match of the night, the antics at the press conference really made this a seller on the card. It turned the Dream Slam a spot on the front cover of Weekly Pro Wrestling, something that a Joshi promotion almost never got, and that was a couple of days before the event. Now for most matches I've generally gone with a broader summary. That seemed best, especially as there's quite a lot of bouts and the action so quickly probably wouldn't be best served by such a blow-by-blow -blow approach. Hakuto vs Kandori, however? Well, this one needs the full detailed blow-by-blow -blow account. Blow by blow is appropriate, seeing as Hakuto starts this match by punching Kandori square in the face, sending her out of the ring. Hakuto then gets on the house mic and asks Kandori if that's all she's got, but Kandori soon responds with slaps and lariats and then locking an armbar on Hakuto who's in the ropes but is hurt bad by it, sending her out of the ring and selling as if Kandori just ripped her shoulder out of its socket. This is one of the main bits of psychology here. As a legit shooter, Kandori's submissions are treated like death moves, and Hakuto must avoid them at all costs. Once Hakuto re-enters the ring, the fighting continues. It's incredibly heated and stiff, much like the previous match. 
Kandori continues to attempt submissions after getting the better of exchanges, although Hakuto also has a go. However, hers are notably not as effective as Kandori's. Then comes another big moment. The fight spills to the outside, and Hakuto tries to execute a tombstone on the announcer's table. However, Kandori reverses and hits a dangerous tombstone of her own. You can even see the freaking crack in the table, and these ones don't have much give. We're just a few minutes in, and the LLPW star has a big advantage. The result of this is that Hakuto comes back with a huge, muta scale break-in crimson mask. She's drenched in blood. In the ring, Kandori tries to punch and kick Hakuto out of existence, with the drama already off the charts. However, Hakuto is able to reverse with a lariat, and then it's her turn to pummel Kandori. She takes her out of the ring and all the way into the audience, blasting her into the rails repeatedly and showing just how hard and dirty she can fight. When Kandori eventually comes back to the ring, she too has been bloodied up. Not as badly as Hakuto, but still pretty nasty. The crowd are expectedly loud as hell for all of this. The match continues, of course. Both continue to simply fight each other, and even if there's not a whole lot of wrestling moves, the storytelling is something else. Kandori hits a plancha on the outside, followed by a backdrop, and Hakuto only just survives a rear naked choke attempt. Hakuto is able to reply with slaps, and then hits one of her legendary short pile drivers. Kandori's submissions remain a serious threat, and she can take advantage of any slight mistake to apply one. However, Hakuto continues to find the ropes. Hakuto knocks Kandori down once more, hits one splash off the top rope, but lands on Kandori's feet when she goes for a second. There is absolutely nothing between these two as Kandori hits a powerbomb for a big near fall. Hakuto gets her own near fall from a dragon suplex, but then gets caught going to the top. Kandori pulls her off and twirls her around, ultimately resulting in a sleeper. It's the most tense submission yet, and again, using all of her energy, Hakuto manages to find the ropes. We're getting close to the finish, and there's no telling who's going to come out on top. Hakuto reverses an Irish whip and hits a powerbomb of her own for another near fall. The fighting again goes to the outside with Kandori reeling. Amazingly, so far in, and with so much damage, Hakuto nails a brilliant tope on Hilo off the ropes, followed by a plancher from the top rope. Does she finally have the crucial advantage? Back in the ring, Hakuto calls for her signature Northern Lights bomb, but Kandori reverses again, attempting a cross arm breaker. Another very close call indeed. Kandori continues to desperately attempt submissions, but gets caught. Hakuto hits a backdrop hold for a near fall. Finally, Hakuto is able to nail her finisher, blasting Kandori with the Northern Lights bomb, and Kandori kicks out. Everyone is in shock, just about nobody kicks out of the Northern Lights bomb. Hakuto goes for it again, but Kandori reverses and hits the Northern Lights bomb of her own. However, Hakuto also kicks out. They have hit each other with the absolute best that they've got, and it wasn't enough. At this stage, utterly exhausted, Hakuto and Kandori have nothing but fists. They blast each other with haymakers, throwing all the energy they have left into them. On the third go, they both hit each other at the same time, laying each other out. But Hakuto just has enough energy to crawl over Kandori's body and get the free count. It's a different sort of finish, but the match is over. And perhaps something like this was the only way that it could finish. There's no respect or handshake either. Kandori eventually storms out, while Hakuto says that she will never lose to a judo wannabe. Even after such a war, this most certainly isn't over by a long shot. Whew! Well, this match is something else. 30 minutes of sheer hell. Even on such a brilliant card, one that's filled from top to bottom with the most wonderful action, this bout was a level beyond. It was the match that absolutely everybody was talking about afterwards. It had been a long time since Joshi had seen such a bloody and hateful war, perhaps not since the peak days of Chigusa Nagayo and Dump Matsumoto. 
This felt like a legitimate fight. Not a technical showcase by any means, but the storytelling and drama was just unreal. It quite rightly received a 5 star rating from The Observer and quickly became a match that you simply had to see. There really aren't too many matches like this one and yeah, it has to go down as one of the greatest bouts of all time. In a career filled with masterpieces, it's quite possibly Akira Hakuto's finest hour and Shinobi Kandori was more than a match for her on this night. Both are legends, of course, even without this match that would be the case, and to go through their career achievements would take a long freaking time. But this is quite possibly the peak, not just of their respective careers, but maybe of Joshi Pro Res. You might well have forgotten that there is still one match to go, but it is, indeed, now time for the main event. The top face team in AJW, Manami Toyota and Toshio Yamada, are going up against the big FMW duo, Megumi Kudo and Combat Toyoda, the former AJW hopefuls who would blossom to become stars in the new, alternative promotion. There's certainly a lot of styles on offer, the brawling of Toyoda, the heart of Kudo, Yamada's striking and Toyota's aerial assaults. All of that's going to be on display. That said, you hardly envy them. You wouldn't envy anybody who has to follow the match that's just taken place that, in all honesty, most people thought of as the real main event. It's very much a Jericho and Triple H following Rock and Hogan at WrestleMania X8 type of deal, in other words. But even if Lorin's still smeared in blood from the epic war that preceded it, you can be pretty damn sure that these two teams are going to put on a fine show. This match, perhaps understandably, tends to be overlooked on the Dream Slam card. It goes quite long at 28 minutes, the exhausted crowd are understandably subdued for a lot of it, and it had to follow Hakuto vs Kandori. All that said, this is still a pretty damn good bout. It's a little slow going at first, but the crowd do start to get pretty into it. Everyone certainly has a part to play in this one. You do get a bit of FMW type brawling, although there's no weapons or blood, and you certainly get some nice fire in the strikes from Yamada. But in the main, this match is the Manami Toyota show. She's typically incredible, being in the ring for most of it, selling a terrific beating from Kudo and Toyota, and then going on the offensive with her amazing aerial skills. She's up there at the very top level of Shoshi for a damn good reason. This is of course not to underrate everyone else in the match. Yamada is absolutely brilliant as well and shouldn't be cast aside in favour of her partner. And while Kudo and Toyota aren't on the same skill level as this team, they're more than able to hold their own here. You do get some pretty nice moments from everyone in the match. Still, the final match of the night goes to the home team. After working from the bottom for most of the bout, Manami Toyota is finally able to seize an advantage and with Toyota out of commission, she plants Kudo with the Japanese Ocean Cyclone Suplex to get the victory. Are there better tag matches on the card than this main event? Yes, but it is a good way to end the show, with Zenjo's top face team standing tall. Again, all four of these wrestlers are very much in the legends bracket. Megumi Kudo and Combat Toyota would, of course, be better known as rivals than as a team, and they paired up for some of FMW's most famous bouts, particularly their final exploding barbed wire death match in 1996, just before Toyota's retirement. Kudo joined Toyota in retirement the following year, following another great barbed wire match with Shark Tsuchiya, and after FMW neither stepped foot in the ring again. Toshio Yamada, as mentioned, can sometimes get overlooked when compared to her main partner, despite the classics they wrestled both as a team and indeed against each other, but she's absolutely on the top level, an undoubted great when she retired in 2004. And Minami Toyota? Well, she ended up basically achieving everything in a 30-year career, wrestling around the world, winning title after title, having an all-time great year in 1995, and finally winding up in 2017 as one of the very greatest wrestlers Joshi has ever known. And with that, the Dream Slam is done. It kind of goes without saying that the show was a phenomenal success. The huge gate of 16,600 and the merchandise that was sold meant that All Japan women earned a couple of million dollars simply on the night alone. But after the show absolutely knocked it out of the park, well, that would go way up. 
The Dream Slam was a huge talking point in all of pro res for months afterwards, earning AJW and Joshi as a whole a big chunk of mainstream attention and essentially being the beginning of another boom period. AJW and the other promotions would have a whopping increase in attendance and viewers thanks to the Dream Slam. The show itself became a hot product. AJW sold the video set of the supercard for the cool sum of around $150, but the price didn't matter as whenever they brought the videos to shows, they would sell out of them almost immediately. There was even a game to commemorate the event. Human Entertainment released Fire Pro Joshi All Star Dream Slam in 1993, one of the few Fire Pro games to have an official license. I think another thing that needs to be said about this Joshi boom in particular is while the action in companies like AJW was often always good, booms in the past were often accompanied with mainstream success and were often the result of mainstream success with the Crush Girls releasing singles and so on. This was a boom pretty much entirely based around the quality of the company's wrestling and that's different and certainly in this case better. There was a sequel to the Dream Slam that happened very quickly. In fact, Dream Slam 2 occurred only a couple of days later. While the second show isn't as well remembered as the first, it's still seen as a damn good one. You've got big singles bouts like Chigusa Nagayo taking on Bull Nakano, the FMW team of Kudo and Toyota against the LCO, and a rematch between the amazing teams of Manami Toyota and Toshio Yamada versus Dynamite Kansai and Mayomi Ozaki another all-time classic that would earn five stars from The Observer. Speaking of The Observer, the first Dream Slam won the Sheets year-end award for Major Card of the Year, which is, well, pretty obvious, really. It goes without saying that the Dream Slam is one of the best supercards there's ever been. It's a five-hour show where, honestly, the time flies by and you basically won't be bored for just about any portion of it. Even the martial arts bout can't exactly drag things down, a mere speck on a show that otherwise is essentially perfect. As a show on its own, it's an all-timer, and it's even better when you consider it as the beginning to a boom that would lead all Japan women all the way to the Tokyo Dome, a time when they had a countless amount of incredible matches along the way, and when they could put even the greatest wrestling promotions to shame. Bye for now.